I'm Vital Lands Illinois Network Architect. Um, and the network architects for the Vital Lands Illinois uh, program, um, we work to, to kind of coordinate the work of the Vital Lands Illinois um, network. And part of that is organizing uh, the annual summit meeting that we have every year in February, um, which is a gathering of environmental um, people across the state of Illinois. And the history of that network uh, uh, is for the first network. It was a smaller group of people across the state um, who were trying to kind of figure out what this network would be and um, what, what was needed across the state. And as the network began to evolve and grow and the interest in, this, interest in the annual gathering, the summit began to grow, um, uh, we realized uh, for the summit last year that it was really time to open up uh, the summit um, to the wider environmental community across the state. And in that spirit, um, the theme of the summit back in February was integrative conservation. And how can we make conservation uh, across the state more relevant, more effective, more impactful? Uh, um, and that was by taking a look at how networking, uh, which is a core function of the Vital Lands Illinois could be um, best served. So some of the things, the topics that we had at the summit uh, under integrative conservation, uh, we uh, have followed up this summer with these, um, these webinars on certain topics. So we were talking uh, at the summit about how do we integrate our work with, for example, the agricultural community, um, engaging with tribal nations, working with urban communities and, and community conservation, uh, working better uh, in our partnerships and how we can become more effective uh, working statewide on uh, many of these issues. And it was very well received and people requested sort of follow-up work. So that is the purpose of these um, webinars. So today's presentation by Shan Sullivan is part, part of our interest uh, in, in continuing be, to begin this conversation in the conservation community across the state of Illinois. Um, and there's a lot of interest in this. People have been, you know, kind of wondering what, what's going on? Uh, how can we uh, engage better? How can we communicate better? How can we um, maybe shift some of our thinking? So to that end, we've invited Shannon Sullivan, uh, who currently serves as the Vital Lands Illinois facilitator to present today. And Shannon, thank you very much for doing this and welcome. And I wonder if you could start by sharing a little about your journey on this topic. Sure. Thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you so much, Todd. Um, and thanks, everybody. We're up to 40 now. So the number just sort of keeps rising of folks who are on the Zoom um, and or on the phone. Um, uh, it's really a privilege to be with you all today. Um, I am going to ideally, yes, look, advance the slides. See, it's all happening. No, um, <laughs> So I'm Shannon Sullivan. Um, I'm a nonprofit consultant. Um, I run a firm called the Groundswell Alliance, um, Cooperative Consulting for Social and Ecological Good. Um, as part of that work, I have the privilege of being the current facilitator for the Vital Lands Illinois Network Architects and also the annual summit. So if you were there this past year, you saw a lot of me, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately, at the summit. Um, in terms of the work we're gonna talk about today, um, I also uh, am currently um, running a project that's called Interrogating Whiteness. 
Um, and you can find that online at interrogatingwhiteness.org. I have both my email addresses on this slide, and these slides are gonna go out after this webinar. I cannot encourage enough folks reach out to me. Um, this is really, maybe not even the most ideal way to begin this conversation with a bunch of people on a webinar, but I really personally feel like these conversations are critical. Um, and so I'm just glad to have the opportunity to start it in, in any way possible. Um, uh, my own journey to Carrie's question is I'm a foster parent. I uh, currently uh, have two adopted kids who also happen to be black. Uh, who live, um, I have the privilege of living with, I guess I should say, and, and playing a parenting role in their lives. Um, and I've been foster parenting for about 10 years. And the more work that I've done on that, the more I've become convinced that, you know, our sort of collective journey around race and racial healing is integral both to our humanity and also to our relationship with the land. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that as we go. So the way that this is structured is very unfortunately, I'm gonna be talking at you <laughs> for a few minutes at the beginning. Um, I do have a few slides that I've made that I think will ground us in the work around whiteness, at least in my current understanding of it. Um, then you are gonna be broken up. It, Zoom does it automatically, I should say, and Todd's gonna help with that into groups with two guiding questions, then we come back as a larger group, and then two more guiding questions, you'll have the same group. Um, and then we'll come back again as a large group, and then we'll talk about some of the resources that I wanted to highlight today. But you are also going to get a link to an evaluation at the end of this. Please do us the favor of filling that out because there was so much interest, we wanna figure out how to continue doing this work, and that's gonna help us do that. Um, I, you know, I want to start, I always start with group agreements. Um, I should say that when I run interrogating whiteness groups, they're much smaller than this. Uh, <laughs> and we are the same group of people that meet together regularly over time. Um, and we sit in circle with each other. Um, and so when you sit in circle, you use these three tenants that I have there on the right side of your screen, which is listen with attention, respond with intention, and tend to both your own well-being and that of the group. So when you're in small group work, that's going to be a really important one, right? Um, and I know like a lot of you, like, well, I do it too. You sign up for a webinar and you figure you're going to clean out your inbox or like get on a conference call while you're doing the webinar or we've all done it. I would like to offer that this content is not the best for that strategy. Um, so if you're able to sort of focus yourself, maybe put your feet on the ground, maybe take a deep breath, whatever ways that you might be able to center yourself during our time together, if that's possible for you in your environment, I'd like for you to consider that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to be sure to say is that when I run interrogating whiteness groups, it is all white people. So white identified folks self-select into the groups that I run in order to interrogate our own whiteness together. Today we have, you know, my guess is black folks, indigenous folks, other folks of color on this webinar along with tons of white people, um, me included. Um, and so I just, especially in small groups, I wanna be able to tend to that as well. Um, and that goes back to tend to your own well-being and that of the group. Um, so I think that's enough sort of asterisks. Um, with that said, I'm gonna go through the few slides that I have and then hopefully we'll get a chance to actually engage with one another. Um, so what are we doing today? Um, the idea is to just dig into the construction of whiteness and this is very specific to the United States context which is settler colonialism, right? And we're gonna talk about that. I always say to people, I don't know what it's like to be white in Finland or white in Sweden or I don't, all the other places people are white, right? Um, so it is tremendously specific to the United States context. Um, we're gonna start together to question the ways that whiteness shows up in our work um, based on that construction and understanding. And then really we're just gonna think and wonder about how racial justice work fits into our work. 
Um, I am not a conservation expert and do not pretend to be. My, my entire sort of professional history is in LGBTQ youth organizing, um, but I have had the opportunity and I'm grateful to work with quite a few groups focused on conservation. Um, so that's what you are going to sort of like bring into the space is your own expertise in conservation work. Um, so this is our sort of like our motto, I guess I should say, in interrogating whiteness. Um, um, who, you can't gotta love a good James Baldwin quote, right? Um, and so the idea is in the work that we do together as white folks to interrogate whiteness is not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is something we always start our circles with, just to remind ourselves that the work we're doing is, is facing it and figuring out what can be changed. All right, so I said already that this is very specific to the United States context. Um, and I think it has to be, particularly because of the, the history, histories, um, that we grapple with, or don't grapple with, honestly, in this country, which is settler colonialism was a project of simultaneously eradicating indigenous peoples um, and then building our economy on chattel slavery. Um, and this has actually continued into the present day, um, I argue often, um, in various ways um, that it has been perpetuated over time. Um, but really thinking about the history of the United States is the project of, you know, both sort of land theft, genocide, and then chattel slavery. Um, oh, did some, was someone saying something? I missed it. No, okay. Um, so really, um, the idea behind settler colonialism, right, is wanting the land, but not the people that were here on the land when settlers showed up um, in this country, which was actually not a country at that point. Um, and, and in order to do that, really, it, it, the project becomes about otherizing, right? So indigenous people are made into savages, or indigenous people are made into sort of folk to perpetrate violence, right? And all of that is a way to clear folks off land, right? Um, because the land was seen as valuable um, and, um, you know, settler, I mean, think about the word settler, right, is coming and settling a particular piece of land. Um, and I, I, I should say, I use chattel slavery on purpose because chattel means property of the owner. Right, um, we, and when interrogating whiteness, we actually go through a series of both laws that were done in this country when we started legislating as the United States and also then into Supreme Court decisions that actually allowed chattel slavery to mean really true ownership of people. Um, an example is the Virginia Slave Codes, I think it's 1685, that was the first time that allowed slave owners to actually kill slaves in the process of correction, right? And that's the first time it's referenced that you could actually legally murder another person as long as it was in the course of correcting a slave in terms of behavior. Um, so I use chattel slavery and I, and I do so on purpose um, because it says right here, the person was ownable, punishable, and murderable, right? Um, and, and those were laws that started in Virginia um, but continued into other colonies um, as chattel slavery continued over time. Um, and, it, you know, I mean, so this is the sort of other point at that top point of the triangle, the settler colonialism, which you saw at the beginning when you saw the whole. Um, so um, settlers are not a particular group. I do want to say this, but settlers are defined by their actions, right? Um, so people who came here and settled the land, those were the actions that they perpetrated in settling the land, right? Um, and you can never just sort of singularly go across any group and make any judgment or distinction. Um, but we can categorize certain sets of actions, right, in a, in a historical context of settler colonialism. Okay, so this is where I wanted to get to. Um, I'm sort of condensing what we do over like two months of work, but 
Um, I think this is a useful graphic. It's not my favorite, but it's one way to put it all on one screen. And so I wanted to be able to offer it today. So the red is the sort of early American definition of white, right? Um, and you'll see that that includes England. Um, in case it's harder for you to see on your screen, I don't know how big it's coming up for you. Um, the blue is actually not as relevant to our conversation today, but that's the Nazi definition of Aryan, right, is the blue. So what I would offer is that blue became sort of, after it was just England, became also an American definition of whiteness, right? Um, the green is sort of that later extension. You can see it going over um, into France, up to Scotland, right? Um, and then the rest of it, is the modern United States census definition of white, right? And by modern, it's been that way for a while. Um, I don't mean contemporary, I actually mean modern. Um, and you can see how it got extended into Italy, into Ireland, into Spain, over to Turkey, right? Um, and and I, I do wanna say that um, whiteness, I think everybody knows this, is not anything that is biological, physiological, or genetic, right? Um, I have no more genetically in common with somebody else who is labeled or identifies as white in this country than I could possibly have with somebody who is identified as black or, um, you know, uh, Mexican American, Central America, any other ways that people might identify. There is nothing genetic about the idea of race and certainly the idea of whiteness. Whiteness is a construction. Um, and it is, it's construction across the world in different ways. In the United States, whiteness is a construction that has strategically changed and been redefined over time. You can see this in the colors, right, on this chart, to include more and more folk, right? Um, but it, in a strategic way to maintain power, right? Um, so Bacon's Rebellion is an example that's often offered. Um, it's a terrible example because it was folks uniting to fight indigenous peoples. But Bacon's Rebellion was a slave-led rebellion that actually was cross-racial at the time. Um, and so uh, th that idea that actually slaves and indentured servants, there were white, I'm putting that in quotes, indentured servants in early America too, could actually band together to rebel against slave owners became very troubling and problematic um, to the folks in power at the time. And in order to really say, okay, how do we nip this in the bud? What could potentially become what we would call today class warfare, right? So folks banding together across racial identities um, who are poor or, I mean, in chattel slavery, it isn't even poverty, it's just nothing. Um, to then band together against the slave owner. And so what was done after Bacon's Rebellion, again, was a series of laws that codified, uh, for example, the one drop rule um, is often mentioned in the United States context, where if you have any bit of blackness, right, in your history or scene, then you're identified as black, right, and not as white. And then expanding the definition of whiteness to folks coming from these other areas, which you know started out in Western Europe, but expanded into Eastern Europe over time um, in order to expand the class of white people, even if they're poor, if they're included in the definition of whiteness, it gives them potentially access to some amount of power um, that they would not have had access to otherwise. And I'm sure there are lots of folks listening who might be familiar with, there's a book, How the Irish Became White, um, that a lot of folks have read, um, sort of talking about, I'm half Irish and half Italian, and so this is stuff I think about all the time, especially in terms of my own family history, um, about you know how, uh, how Irish immigrants were originally treated in the United States context and how they became treated over time as they were added into the definition of whiteness. Um, there's so many books, I could go on and on and on. Um, but I did, I want to um, sit with this for a little bit because this is going to start to bring it into the conservation context, um, which I want to start talking about and I know obviously is of immense interest to everybody who's joined us. Um, this is something you have to stare at for a little while. <laughs> Um, I know this. Um, and you may have seen versions of this floating around. I've seen lots of different versions um, of this. This is one I'm using right now. I'm going to just offer that it's probably imperfect. 
Um, but what I like about engaging or thinking about this as a graphic is that you start with the colonization on the top, right? So this notion that you could show up on some distant shore, right, um, where things are already happening, perhaps human beings are already living, certainly nature <laughs> is already there, right, um, and begin to manipulate it or begin to claim it or begin to, you know, call it your own in whatever ways you're calling it your own actually is a, a thought process that leads to these dualities here in the United States of what became both supremacism broadly and capitalism as an economic project, right? Um, well, supremacism is the birth of white supremacy, right? This notion that one skin color or one identity or one characteristic can be better than others or is naturally better than others. And that idea of supremacy has also led to male supremacy and patriarchy, right? So that it has led us to genderism, right? So that one gender has more privilege than another, right? The, the notion that that's even a thing comes from colonization, comes from relying on supremacism, right? As a philosophical sort of theory. And this also leads to our ideas about the land. Right? Um, and that's why I like using this slide in the conservation context, because human supremacy broadly, right, has led us to exploitation of natural resources, what's called ecocide here on this slide. Um, that may not be the preferred word for y'all, but you all were, you, you know what I'm speaking of, right? This notion that we can extract from the land or, you know, uh, until we can't extract anymore, that's human supremacy, right? Enacting itself on the land and has led us to a climate crisis among many other things. Um, and so I think this brings it into the conservation context as well in terms of why all of you are even engaged in the work that you're in, I, I think is rooted in a lot of notions of human supremacy over the land. Um, as opposed to a different philosophical theory that might have been about balance, right? Or might have been about reverence, <laughs> um, or might have been about, you know, really figuring out how can humans actually live in partnership with the land so that everybody thrives, right? That, that's not the United States project. That's not how the United States project was ever conducted. Um, so some of the things, and I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna let this just sit here for a moment, um, you know, capitalism um, relied on cheap labor. Um, a lot of that is chattel slavery, um, certainly in, in the founding of this country. Um, people argue that the Civil War was, was fought about slavery. The, the Civil War was fought about capitalism. Um, the South's economy was entirely reliant on chattel slavery in order to survive. Um, there is a not so famous quote by Abraham Lincoln um, that's actually on the Interrogating Whiteness website if you go there, that he outright said that he would have fought the Civil War whether or not people were keeping slaves or not keeping slaves, right? Um, and, and would have given, given that up had it come to that. Um, and so I, I think really thinking about how our economy was founded as well. And that also bears our relationship to the land, I would argue, right? Um, uh, uh, is that chattel slavery was the economic driver, for, particularly for Southern states in cotton production. Um, and after the Civil War, um, anyway, I'm going down, a, I was gonna talk about the Homestead Act and the <laughs> Reconstruction. <laughs> um, we really do spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, but I want to highlight, too, the, the two words that are in orange over there, which are um, trauma is the largest one, um, and then inflammation below that, um, both of the land and of people, um, is that, you know, we're all hurting from this project, right? We, the land is hurting, the people are hurting, um, you know, I think our... <sighs> What do I want to say? I, I, I think that really trying to recognize 
that all of the work that we're doing um, in conservation or in social justice or, you know, even in our families, whatever it is that we may be doing, um, I think part of that is recognizing the, the trauma of this um, and how it has worked its way into our, our present day. Um, and also how it's worked its way into our relationship, what I would argue is largely a broken relationship with the earth, right? Um, and certainly in this country, you know, the land of the United States um, and, you know, why we're even addressing a climate crisis right now. Um, yeah, I'm gonna leave that there for a second. And I'm gonna time check myself, oh, we're doing good, okay. All right, um, so again, I'm not any kind of conservation expert. Um, maybe I'm not an expert in much, um, but I think some of the ways that people have offered to me that this comes up in conservation, and if you actually, we had sent out an article just as sort of something to read before this that talks a little bit about this in terms of a historical perspective. Um, but, you know, colonialism is, is sort of rooted in, you know, I'll put civilization in quotes, right? So what was civilized and what was not? Um, that led to this view that white farmers had to displace the Indian, I will also put that in quotes, um, in order to, uh, that redeem should be in quotes as well, right? Um, because what does that even mean? Um, you know, we, we do honestly preserve, everybody knows this, preserve land without owning its theft from indigenous peoples. And perhaps the intend, attendant indigenous history slash present that may or may not be on the land. Um, that was one of the sessions, honestly, we had the honor of, of welcoming uh, Chloris from uh, a tribal nation to talk about land preservation and attendant indigenous history slash presence. Um, uh, certainly, I mean, I could go on and on and on about denial of landowning rights to non-white folks in this country, which actually continues to this current day, um, just in different forms and policies. Um, and, um, it, uh, but certainly was legislated in many different ways over the course of our history in very obvious ways. Um, I mean, I think uh, uh, Steve Barg, I think mentioned this um, about his work uh, with First Nation folks is that, you know, um, what keeps him up at night is all the treaties that we backed our way out of with indigenous folks over the course of our history and how he doesn't want to repeat that kind of really disavowal um, uh, in his work with indigenous folks. Um, so there were outright denial of landowning rights, uh, both to indigenous folks, certainly um, to folks who survived chattel slavery um, and the continuing on. Um, sometimes I see, you know, this focus on the financial benefits of conservation, it, which is an awesome talking point um, that I think we have to use at, at various points in our work. I have seen it used really well. Um, but certainly healing, right, is more of a benefit of conservation than a financial benefit. Um, and certainly I mean, folks who work in environmental justice know that there has also, because of this same sort of denial of land owning rights to non-whites and the history that we have in this country, a lot of pollution has been pushed into urban centers or into the periphery of urban centers. You see this with incinerators. You see, I mean, you can see battles in communities over time around concentrations of carcinogens, um, be it in rivers or in, you know, groundwater, et cetera, um, that have been pushed there uh, because it's easier to put it in, you know, disadvantaged communities, right, than in communities where folks might be able to have the power and privilege to fight back. Um, whew, I'm going to pause. Um, I knew this was going to be <laughs> a lot when we decided to do this in a webinar format. Um, I hope you all are just practicing some grace. That's what I'm trying to do um, as I go through here. I think... Yes, that we are gonna move into small group work, which I think is hopefully a really, really good thing. So just initially, like what are your understandings and or questions about whiteness in the United States context? And how do you experience or think about whiteness and conservation work? 
I just want to highlight that the primary is the conversation <laughs> that you all are having. Um, I am a firm believer that all of this work depends on humans actually talking to each other. So please do that. <laughs> um, and then the secondary is the notes and co-vision, but it will help me as sort of your facilitator to be able to see those as they're coming through. So there are things coming in on co-vision. Um, I did, because I just glanced at it, I saw one question about that definition of uh, whiteness, and it is from the census. Um, so um, I'm trying to look at the other ones. Yeah, here we go. So we've got lack of caring because the climate crisis isn't immediately present in our backyard, intentionally ignoring the problem, ability to compartmentalize and engage with disaster only when it's convenient. Um, do folks from that group want to say anything or, or add it? You can unmute yourself um, and totally talk, <laughs> like actually engage. Yeah, hi. Um, I, don't, I don't know if the rest of you, I was the one who was taking notes for us. Um, I think it was some of the ideas that surfaced were very much whether or not there are, I had um, in my group, I had two folks who I said were newer to Vital Lands. Um, and so I had asked them, you know, what, have you seen any barriers to this in your experience to the type of work that we do? And it came to the discussion of, you know, some of the elements of um, we're able to push things off, we're able to not engage with issues immediately um, because they're not right in our backyard. Whereas there are people who are, whose identities are politicized, who are fighting every day um, for recognition and acceptance. And we as a sector sometimes are able to not necessarily make the best bridges and connections to people who really could, who really need some help and who our work can serve. Hi, Patrick. Thank you. Hi, Shannon. <laughs> um, and then the second one, we've got not seeing a lot of diversity. Um, my assumption is that's racial diversity, but I want to ask about that. In conservation, practitioners or professionals, how do we get beyond that? Anybody want to chime in from that group? You can well, unmute. You don't have to. Yeah. I, I, that, that was our group. And uh -huh. I I think, um, yeah, I mean, that was just, that's just something that we all kind of observe and, and we don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was actually not a part of that group, but I was looking through, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. totally. Hi. Oh, okay, okay. Hi. Yeah, I was looking through the rest of the people on the chat and I was like, oh, okay. I'm like one of the only, or I think I am the only like black person on here, which isn't a problem. But just to like um, put that into my context, I think a way to, I guess, broaden the job to different races and different religions and things like that would be to educate just even on a school level, because I just graduated from high school. Um, and I'm going into zoology with a concentration in wildlife and conservation, but that's not heard of over here. Like, right. that's not even, I'm from Maryland. So like a lot of people, even though the Chesapeake's here and all that, we have woods and everything else, people aren't going into those kind of fields. And then on top of that, I'm black. So you don't see a lot of people of color in this field as well. And I just think that if the information is there and it's not like a matter of like shoving it down the youth's throat, but it's putting it into a more, like making it more palatable, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Not even for just like minorities, but just my generation in general, because we understand like, oh, global warming. Oh, the world's gonna end. Like, it's a joke to us though. It's not really like, it's not like, oh, this is actually like going to happen. So I think if we make that more understandable and if we go into spaces maybe we won't feel as comfortable in, because if we do, we have to get opinions from all walks of life in order to, I guess, I don't want to say like save the world, but we really <laughs> are saving the world. Oh, yeah. So I think it's just very important to go out into different spaces and bring in people from those different spaces so that we can have understandings from different people. Thank you so much. And thanks for being with us.
Um, I do see, I know Todd is sort of scrolling as we're going. I, I did see that some of us are white immigrants, which causes us to struggle with being categorized as white um, and seeing maybe being treated better than immigrants that are people of color immigrants. Um, I don't know if folks from the group want to add to this. This is something we talk a lot about in interrogating whiteness. Um, and uh, particularly around sort of Eastern European immigration currently, right, in present day. Um, so I, I did see that one there. Does anybody want to add to that? Somebody just texted me, which you probably all heard. Um, <laughs> um, and this whiteness seems to be considered the default or norm and non-white is the different. Hi, that seems to be coming from our group. Um, just a point that we discussed about how historically, uh, I guess like especially in the United States, um, to be white was considered like to be um, like participating in the universal and that was like the standard, it was um, pure, it was uh, like untainted. Um, and then basically that can only exist uh, in conversation with its with its opposite or with like what it's being compared to, which would be like blackness or brownness or any other thing which was viewed as like a, a differentiation from the norm um, and then was like branded and demarcated as that and treated as some sort of um, deviation. Yeah. And we were just kind of wondering how if if and how and in what ways that has carried over into like present day society and you know surely something is like as bedrock as an idea that there's like a the default or like the the norm and the universal and like a deviation from that um like doesn't just evaporate so what what ways has it like shifted yeah thank you um, there's a book I list in the resources at the end called Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi, where he actually makes the argument that, that, you know, our understandings around like, oh, racism is interpersonal, and then it gets translated into our systems, right? He argues that our systems were constructed based on racism, and all of us have been then trained up in these systems that are built in racist ways and then impact and infiltrate even in unknown ways, right? Our thoughts, beliefs, thinking, how we interact in the world, that, that right? This whiteness as the default, right? Um, so he would argue that our systems actually train us. So be it public schools, be it government, be it, you know, whatever system it is, actually trains us to be racist and does it on purpose. Um, and so his argument is that the only remedy is a systemic and structural remedy. Um, so I, anyway. Um, can, I, uh, can I jump in with a quick sort of... Hi, Brandon. Hi. Uh, <laughs> sort of like a quick personal, like, sort of connection to what you just said, Shannon, which was, um, you know, I was born and raised in the city of Detroit um, during the, you know, waning years of the height of white flight out of that city. And, and something I was sharing in the group um, was that I struggle with the sort of inherent sort of racism that I feel in myself that comes from growing up in that in that era and in that time and sort of in sort of thinking about and I come at that Italian um, and Irish American like you um, you know and and son of a single mother and 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 you know first person in my family to go to college and all that but like there still is all that construction of like of thinking about black communities and white communities having been raised in that era that I struggle with now I struggle with that all the time um, as in it's part of that construction of beyond the interpersonal about how how mm -hmm. severely racist a place that was Detroit in the 80s yeah Oh, thank you, Todd. I think we should scroll down too because there's a few more um, just in the second question. How do you experience or think about um, whiteness and conservation work? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to, uh, sorry, I'm just reading them so you'll excuse me. 
<laughs> but I don't know if anybody wants to chime in about their group work around this question. Um, well, I guess I could talk again. Oh, well. Um, uh, I was saying how um, I currently volunteer at my local zoo and how I'm like one of the few black people there, not even just like volunteering, but also who work like hand, like with the animals. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting to see. And so like, um, I do animal handling, which is where I have an actual like embassy animal with me. And I teach the visitors about it. And I relate it back to conservation and our zoo message. And it's just interesting to see, I guess, all the little like school groups and camps that'll come, whether it's like mainly white people, mainly black people. And like, I feel like a sense of pride because even if they don't like the young black kids who come to me, even if they don't think like, oh, it's a black person, I can relate to her. It's like, I'm happy that I can be that person that can open the gate for them that like, hey, people that look like us can go into that field. It's not just like a certain look. Anybody can do yeah, this. Totally. And yeah, because that's not really a thing, not even just like for black people, but no, really for black people, that's not a field we think of. We usually think of building businesses, being doctors, lawyers, things like that. And my parents are immigrants. So being in the medical field, being a lawyer, that was even more important in my household. So conservation and working with animals was literally completely left field from what anybody in my family was thinking of doing, including my friends as well. So yeah, it's just, I don't feel necessarily as an out, sometimes I feel like an outsider, but usually I just feel hopeful and happy that I'm one of the people that are going to be bringing this field into like a new light and going to be bringing new people um, from different places into this field. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I do think, wow, we got a lot. Todd is scrolling through them <laughs> as it's happening. Um, I'm seeing stuff about, you know, not being reflective of the communities we serve, um, having barriers to even accessing, you know, the professional field, which is what you're talking about, right? Um, you know, um, organizations being hierarchical and, you know, white dominated. Um, I don't, I'm trying to, it's Todd sort of scrolling through them and that we do tend to live in, in bubbles. Um, you know, someone, I think an earlier one said, you know, we do rural work and there's not a lot of racial diversity. I would gather that there's probably class diversity depending on where you are. Um, uh, and certainly gender diversity and other things. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, as Todd's going through, I think probably a lot of people are nodding maybe <laughs> as they see some of these, these comments. I mean, I do think that, um, cause I'm someone who'd never considered myself a conservationist until I had the opportunity to work with vital lands, but, um, I help with the school gardens at my kids' school. So I'm a conservationist as it turns out. Um, I was just not informed, um, that I do think sort of living in the age of actually calling it a climate crisis and trying to address it as a climate crisis is an invitation that I think is open to way more folks um uh than maybe would previously have considered themselves caring about conservation or caring about environmentalism i don't know if that's um other people's experiences but thank you for all of this um there's a lot i want to make sure we have time to go into the second group but i also don't want to silence folks so our there are other offerings before you go back into your groups to talk more about like okay, how do we think about this moving forward? Um, I, don't, I don't know if anyone else wanted to jump in. Similar to the points Michaela was making, I think it's um, worthwhile for us to think about the barriers, uh, the purity tests and the gatekeeping that we even often reinforce in our own work. Um, particularly when we think about the experience of being outside and being in nature and how we as a sector, and we've talked about this at Vital Lines a lot, I mean, but we as a sector will tend to put, we will emphasize a pristine natural area. We will emphasize rigorous outdoor recreation at the expense of an urban park that is far more welcoming than a wilderness area to most people. You know, in this, what I, 
often think about is how we in the conservation movement will like to talk about, you know, there are places where you can go hiking and kayaking, all those wonderful things. But every time I go to a forest preserve, go near the parking lot where there are dozens of families out camping and they're out having barbecues and picnics and that's, they're just sitting and enjoying their time together. But we emphasize the, you need to go wander off on the four miles of trails. And this is how you do nature, even though the experience for so many other people is vastly different than what we're prioritizing. I think that's, I mean, if we're really interrogating and investigating what we're doing here, it's important to keep in mind just the gatekeeping that we do. Thank you, Patrick. So I think we're gonna go back. Ideally, it will be the same groups. What would help advance the movement in terms of racial justice and how can that advancement work happen? So Todd's gonna to bring up the co-vision comments that were coming in. Um, and we're just about an hour, like eight minutes from ending. So again, I wanna be careful of folks' time. I did notice one that said, we need to be involved in other movements um, as they were coming in. Um, which is something I've heard before that sort of struck me. Um, with just a couple minutes that we have, are there folks that feel like we really need to offer from, from our group? And then I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about resources. Anybody wanna offer? I know Todd is scrolling through it for you. Oh, I just saw environmental reparations. Um, there are so many conversations we could be having. <laughs> we're we're going to send out all of the comments that, that have come in um, along with the slides and a link to this video. So just so you know that this won't go away and we'll be looking at it further. Yeah, Todd is going to keep scrolling here. Wow. So this is, this is really great because this is where we wanted to kind of launch is to start a conversation um, with the environmental community. And it's something that I think, you know, we're kind of secretly ashamed about, you know, that, you know, we we're we're having these like little internal conversations about things and you know maybe not everybody's sort of acknowledging within our within our organizations that um, we could do more because part of it is we don't know what to do so having this conversation is a good start and and I really want to encourage people to fill out um, uh, the questions at the end because we want to we want to know what do you want next what how can we encourage the development of this com conversation what other things do do we need um, i'm actually signing up for um, a 10 week course on uh, working with a, a small group of white people to address our whiteness uh, and to start really thinking about some of these things that I just take for granted or I don't even notice. Um, and I feel like sometimes these conversations, people don't feel safe having them. So we want to make sure that we set up a safe environment so that we can begin to take these conversations deeper. Um, and that this is, this is just uh, step one in a long process. Totally. I mean, the, it's a 90 minute vital session webinar. And I actually think we, as I see these comments scrolling by, have really made the most of what is a very limited forum to address and talk about these things. So I wanna thank people for that. Um, I'm gonna bring up my PowerPoint just so that I can talk a little bit about the resources. So um, th thank you, Carrie. So the first thing is I, again, you'll get the slides. I had both of my email addresses on like the second slide, I think it was. But um, if you're interested at all in interrogating whiteness, you can just email me at Shannon at interrogating whiteness or go to the website. Um, I run those groups usually in partnership with organizations. Um, so if you wanna deal with whiteness internally, it's something to think about. Um, so we're gonna send out the slides, the co-vision and the recording. 
Um, I don't know if anybody on this, probably some of you have heard of the Avarna group. I, that's a link to their website. So when you get the slide, you can just click right on it. They do diversity work in environmental work broadly. That's the whole focus of what they do. Um, and they have an amazing website where they literally put all their resources up for free. It's indexed, it's searchable. It really is a place just to even scroll through and start to take a look at. Um, there's an academic I admire. He's a graduate student named Michael Frey. That link, when you get the slides, goes straight to his syllabus. Um, he just collects resources that he calls uprooting whiteness. It's cataloged by books, podcasts, films, children's books, right? It's got all the way through. It's just a great place to take a look through um, if you're interested in trying to find some things to read. Um, I have a bit of a podcast addiction problem, which you're about to see, um, because when I'm in my car, it's a way that I can spend my time. Um, so these are just highlighted resources. They, I mean, I, I'm not pretending that they are in any way comprehensive. Um, if you want to read some books, I think these are four great books to start with. The History of White People by Nell Irvin Painter. An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, she's Indigenous. Um, that one's an easy read um, that I recommend to anybody who will listen to me. And I think like in a month, there's a young adult version coming out of that book um, that my kids go to a K through eight, but their middle school, sixth, seventh and eighth grades are gonna be interacting with that in the fall. So it's also a school resource. Stand from the Beginning um, by Ibram X. Kendi is the book I already mentioned. Um, and then White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo is pretty much a staple around any of this. It's a super quick, easy read. Um, another one that you can digest fairly quickly. Um, because I have a podcast problem, um, I think Seeing White is probably the best. If you like podcasts, it's 13 episodes, so it's an investment of time. It is well worth it. Um, and then... Thunder Bay is a shorter one. Um, it's actually specific to an indigenous community in Canada, but I think it has a lot of context for the United States. Um, and This Land by Crooked Media, only two episodes of that are out right now, but it's about indigenous land rights in Oklahoma. Um, and it is riveting. And I'm, I, it's two of eight, I've only listened to two, so I'm recommending it in real time, it's happening. Um, so, um, but again, go to Michael Frey's syllabus. If you don't like podcasts, you can find a movie, you can find, right? There's all kinds of things that you can find. Um, and then I'll leave, this is one of my favorite um, comics, um, which I'm gonna leave you with. I mean, again, this is really what we're kind of grappling with right now, right? So who wants change? Everybody, who wants to change? maybe people on this webinar. I don't <laughs> and so um, I'm gonna end it there. Todd just chatted out the link to the evaluation, right? So you'll get it in an email, but I'm gonna tell you if you, in your next minute, if you click on it right now, you are way more likely to fill it out. And I know this because that's how I am. <laughs> way more likely. It won't take you but two minutes or less. Uh, they're mostly five questions and reader questions. Super helpful moving forward. Um, with that, I really want to thank everyone for their time in this imperfect venue. But I believe it's sort of never the wrong time to start or continue the conversation. So I just appreciate your grace and in joining us. Um, and thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Shannon. Bye. Bye. Bye.